Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A very good morning to all of you. It is really an honor to be here as a moderator. Um, first of all, we have started the day today. It's a great day. It's a philosophy day. So World Forum, World Philosophy Forum Day. So we have started um, with an, a, a, an interesting story by Dr. Hello Ant, a philosopher talking about a garden of knowledge, followed by the man of the day, who got the man in white, really a family man, talk a lot about his family, his wife, his, even his uh, grandchildren. You see, as a speaker just now, talk about charity, peace comes from home. So it starts with from home. So how true indeed. And then um, the speaker uh, followed uh, the most second, the first speaker is Dr. Wan Muhammad Nazrul, has given us a lengthy story, a history of conflict as well as world peace. So now it's time for all of us to listen to the next speaker, the Honorable Professor Dr. Jeffrey Lewitt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now I welcome him to the stage. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, I, I wonder, I was given three pages long about his biodata. <laughs> All right, but I tried to make it short. He's a man of multi hats. He's wearing a lot of hats, yeah? Um, he is a bioengineer, a neurophysiologist, system theorist, historian of public health, director emeritus, Department of Public Health Management, and founding, for, uh, founding dean, National School of Public Health in Athens, Greece. And he is also professor, public health and health diplomacy, European Center for Peace and Development, or better known as ECPD, United Nations. And he is also from University for Peace, Belgrade, Serbia. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you, I present you, Dr. Jeffrey Lewitt. Thank you. The floor is yours. Good morning. And first, let me say thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be with you. Thank you for the hospitality that you have shown to us. And thank you for permitting my daughter Mirella to come with me. And it's so far a wonderful experience. I wanted to start out because there was a tremendous amount of humor this morning. Tremendous amount of humor. And as a neurophysiologist, I believe that Humor is perhaps the highest form of human development because the clever, intelligent humor requires great knowledge. And today, on this World Philosophy Day 2018, here in Malaysia, we have a lot of intelligence and we wish to tap this intelligence to solve the kinds of world problems that have been presented by my young friend, the previous speaker. I wanted to develop for you briefly the context of a Euro-Asian philosophical bridge uh, between the cities that have been named, but in the words of our president for practical philosophy and practical solutions. So today, I'm with you hoping to contribute to Malaysia philosophizers. But let's not forget certain things. The secret of freedom, and freedom was mentioned this morning with that wonderful talk given uh, in freedom, in freedom of expression. So the secret of freedom lies in educating people. 
which was the third plank of our previous speaker's way to promote peace. Whereas the secret of tyranny is in keeping them ignorant, Robespierre, a French. And of course, the other one, Einstein was mentioned at the beginning of my young friend's talk earlier. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it, Einstein. But there are many problems, and there is also much despair in our world. And I believe that the current despair of mankind cannot be better expressed than in the words of Aeschylus, pain so intense, not forgotten, even in sleep, falling from the heart, drop by drop, until in our despair, against our will, wisdom comes through the terrible grace of God. The wisdom of Aeschylus is philosophy, and we are its friends. For me, where did philosophy begin? As a boy, I wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I became an electrical engineer and a physicist. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a great singer. I wanted to have the wonderful voice of Dato with all of its intonations. I wanted to be a great conductor, but I became neither of these things. But where was my first thoughts in philosophy generated? I was probably eight years old when my great-grandmother I don't remember, I only remember the event. And of course, throughout life, I have filled in that event. But it seemed to be something like this. At eight years old, I told my great-grandmother, who was 95 at the time, something that she didn't know. And she told me, I don't know that. And this was so fulfilling. I had told my great-grandmother something she didn't know. But she was taking it as a message to me, ultimately. I realized that afterwards. And she said to me, no matter where you go, no matter who you meet, no matter what color, no matter what creed, no matter what age, you can always learn something. And I think that learning something is perhaps the most important thing that we have. Uh, I also went on to think that to become a philosopher, you had to have something wrong with you, at least indigestion, as the stimulus to think about problems. Small problems, big problems, world problems. And, of course, to understand that philosophers also can become very wily old fellows, like Thales, who bought up all of the olive presses because he understood science. He understood crop failure of the olive crop. And he bought up all of the olive presses. And then when his prediction came true that in several, several crops down the road, there would be a bumper crop, and it came, he rented the olive presses back to the people in Ionia. And he became very, very rich. And from that point on, the Ionians left him alone, a little bit afraid of him, because he was the man that he was, and he went on to be the first, if you will, philosopher in ancient Greek philosophy. And then, of course, we have Socrates. And I wanted to just mention him as a citizen of the world. 
But I also wanted to, and I'm going to retell it, you heard it this morning, and when at the dinner table I told our friend that he looked like a musician to me, uh, he didn't sing to me, but he showed me the wonderful pictures of his garden. And I said to him, but that's music. The garden is music, the colors, the colorfulness of the notes, the colorfulness of the plants. And so he told me the story that he told you this morning, and I said, you're stealing my lines, but I'm going to say it because I have freedom too. And uh, Socrates gave us the advice to young people, marry. If it works, great. If it fails, you can become a philosopher. So that was the first one that I got from Socrates. The second one was about education, was about learning, lifelong learning. He gave us lifelong learning. He was facing the death sentence, and you will hear a little bit more about that, I think, from our president and what we will be doing in Athens next year. And uh, he heard a soldier singing. And he called him, he said, soldier, tell me the song. And the soldier responded, why worry about a song when tomorrow you will be dead? He said, I just have the time to learn one more thing, lifelong learning. And I think the third one that he gave us was quite interesting. And he suddenly realized that he owed the father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, a fee for services rendered to him when he was suffering from indigestion. And he called his scribe and he dictated a note saying, please deliver this to Hippocrates before I die. It was a cockerel and it was for services rendered and it was for services in kind. But first, a little background information because we are here with the World Philosophical Forum and to say again that it was founded in Athens by the Russian philosopher Igor Kondrashin in 2010, so a year from now, the 10th anniversary. In 2011, it was warmly greeted by Irina Bokova, Director General of UNESCO, which promoted philosophy. It builds on the Greek traditions of the Olympic Games and the Dialectical Symposium. The World Philosophy Forum is an independent, international, non-governmental, non-profit organization founded in Greece and has branches spread around the globe in more than 50 countries, I think it's 55. One now in Malaysia, and again, I say I am happy to be here. We are already in the process uh, of preparing the 10th Dialectical Symposium in the tradition of ancient Greece, and with your participation, is, it is deemed imperative. On the urging of Igor Kondrashin, I tried to draw the attention of Ban Ki-moon to this event, and I know that the information has reached him, but we have not yet had a response, and we will continue to alert the leaders of the world to the current set of problems that prevail. And we will continue to tell them that we are able to help to add our little piece in the puzzle that will take us down the road to peace. And yesterday, when we visited Perdana, and we heard about the Perdana Way, one of your universities here, I challenged the students who were dealing with policy, policy for science, technology, and innovation, to come up with a policy for peace. 
uh, and uh, approximately two weeks ago, I did a brainstorming with uh, students in the Balkans, developing through systems theory uh, to come up with some way forward that would take us down the road and we would be able to have a peaceful future. But there are many problems in the future. And the students have taken on that challenge. I saw the one who was given the task yesterday. We shook hands and he said he hasn't had time yet. And he's very busy and I understand. And it is a long process to develop that policy of peace, for peace, when the world knows much more about conflict and war. And of course, as I say, Ban Ki-moon did not respond to us. And politicians are not responding. And we heard this morning from our speaker who was awarded uh, from the World Philosophical Forum. So friends of philosophy, friends of Kuala Lumpur, I managed to say it correct this time. My daughter has been telling me, Dad, you didn't say it correctly. My good friend, Dr. Halun, I have to add my humor here because when we met in Athens, I couldn't understand exactly the pronunciation of the name. So I said, from now on, you are Dr. Halloween. <laughs> and he laughed. And he said, that's OK. And of course, with uh, Mohammed, my friend Mohammed Nizar, he said, it's Nizar. And I said, for me, it will always be Mohammed, because that was the moment uh, that I made him. So, today philosophy is celebrating in Malaysia. Last month it celebrated in Athens. The World Philosophical Forum 2018 in Athens just ended. It examined the relationship between biology and philosophy. Philosophy connects to everything, namely the philosophy of life, or if you will, biophilosophy. It examined what you will hear later from my colleague Stephen Roy uh, about a topic that our president Igor is eager, a pun on words, Igor is eager to examine deeper because it needs a deeper examination. It examined the state of what we are calling social dementia, which we see all around the world. And it has laid down some guidelines for its 10th anniversary celebration. It emphasized, it will emphasize once again the current concept of global citizenship as established first by Socrates and the need for intercontinental linkages. It will also involve if you remember, uh, the Catholic Church revoked uh, its uh, condemnation of Galileo, but a long time afterwards. Uh, but there are certain uh, events in history that have not been revoked. The world has gone on, and de facto, they have been revoked. But symbolically, they have not been revoked. One was Justinian. And I won't say much about that, but the second one is the death sentence on Socrates. Whether we revoke it symbolically or not, it doesn't much matter. But I think what it will do is call attention to what has happened to our world and what we need to do to move forward. So Asia and Europe, the bridge, this is what I am talking about in this particular talk. Uh, and it's been linked 
for good and for bad, down the centuries, Asia and Europe were separated in Greek mythology when the beautiful Europa, which is the name for Europe, a beautiful young girl, Europa, the girl with the wide-eyed gaze. And Zeus was so captivated by Europa that he turned himself into a white bull. And Europa was captivated by the white bull and somehow she started to ride on the white bull who was Zeus and he took her away to Crete. And this is one of the symbolic gestures of the separation uh, between, uh, between Europe and between Asia. But there was also uh, other ways that the connection was made and the separation. The Silk Road is one, ocean currents another, today globalization, yesterday colonization. For tomorrow and from our Euro and across our Euro-Asian bridge, I am suggesting, we are suggesting philosophy. In a world threatened by new and resurgent mosquito and bat-provoked epidemics, environmental disasters accentuated and dramatized by climate change and the nuclear threat with a force capable of hurling mankind back into the Stone Age and with its symbolic clock of the atomic scientists standing at two minutes to midnight to a background of what I have just mentioned, social dementia, we need a new social, economic, and political paradigm. It is mandatory for mankind's survival. It must be applied within a scientific culture. The scientific culture we learned in Perdana, the Perdana way yesterday, we saw the development of, of science. Uh, it, it, we heard it a little bit this morning, but it must also be developed in the context of complexity of the problem space. Returning to Einstein, the problems are so complex that there is no one person can get it into the mind at any one time to be able to change things. It needs a concerted effort. It needs the bridges. It needs the international uh, community. And the paradigm must be mapped onto a universal compact of the global citizen. Because today, and in a world of plenty, how well we have eaten here, wonderful foods, a world of plenty, a world of smiles, but nevertheless, mindlessness characterizes a significant portion of our current moment in history, mounting insecurity in man's forward journey, limited prospects down the road for a better life for many, and little room in which the status quo politics can maneuver to change the direction. It is getting increasingly unstable. And in spite of what we may see overall, because the big picture can take on many shades and many meanings, uh, we can look forward in this plethora of world problems, we can foresee a hostile future, a more hostile future. Today the oceans fill with plastic and the planet destabilizes under the weight of climate change, under the weight of growing corruption, under the weight of social asymmetry, inequality, and growing vulnerability for many parts of our populations. And so today, responsible people everywhere 
are compelled by disasters of the times to face difficult choices, and we face difficult choices, hoping, despite the chaos in which the world finds itself, to preserve humanity and the planet. My friend, Dr. Halloween, Dr. Hallow, hmm? you are working hard in this direction and you are to be congratulated. Your team of industrious workers, encouraging young people with humor, with smiles, in spite of all difficulties, you are moving. You are fashioning a fabric of a great society, particularly in this region, but which is very important ecumenically. It seems to me that if I were to kind of put it all together, that our biggest problem is poverty. And poverty, of course, breeds vulnerability. Poverty brings greater inequality. And just like my previous colleague spoke about education. It seems to me that education for all is the best instrument to promote a stronger awareness of global citizenship and to help reverse current directions towards a planetary breakdown. We know that machinery breaks down. We know that societies can fall apart. If you will, around about 1,200 years BC, when things started to fall apart in northern Greece and throughout Greece and throughout the region, and the Dark Ages were on their way, from those Dark Ages, from that chaos, what came about? Great literature, Homer, and philosophy, Thales, for example, as migrations started to take place. And there was a spread of the Greek world throughout that particular region, taking on different characterizations and different dress to be able to go forward. And from it, we got philosophy that we have to die. So, all of these things, I think, are in the spirit of Socrates and his proclamation, I am a citizen of the world. It seems that this provides an instrument to better understand, regulate, and appropriately use rapidly developing robotics. Yesterday we were innovation, I told you. Rapidly developing robotics and artificial intelligence. I can tell you that I was head of a department in Chicago uh, many years ago now, and one of our topics was actually robotics then with weaker computers. Today we have much stronger computers. Uh, we also were developing artificial intelligence. The aim was with respect to the health of individuals. We are now much more concerned about the health of populations because we have also, besides taking responsibility to move the world towards peace, to move it towards philosophy, we also have to take the responsibility or more responsibility for our own health. And so this means the health of our populations. So a better future for mankind can come by deploying philosophical ideas in education that can precipitate a transformation of humanity in order to guard against its own destruction and a means to conserve the Earth's biosphere. And we have a, a document in Greece and part of what I'm going to just mention now, written by Stephen Roy, uh, and it says what we're all saying, through the cultivation of wisdom, 
through the cultivation of reason, with morality and justice, mankind can be improved and be moved away from the political amoralism and corruption, from ignorance and from a world based on consumerism, from a world that cultures are being destroyed, from a world in which religious differences are being exaggerated and producing conflict when, if you recall the words of our previous speaker, he said, all religions, they are for peace. He said it a little bit differently, but that was it. And I can find in no religion the suggestion that life should not be fulfilling, as in the words of ancient Greek philosophy and in the words of all religions. But it cannot be fulfilling with televisions and with te television that distorts, that brings fake news, that does not educate. It entertains, yes. You know, I, I once remember in the United States uh, being challenged by someone when I said that every month we go for McDonald's. And he said, that's terrible food. I said, I know, but it's tasty. And I think that this is one of our problems, if we can use that as a metaphor, to move ourselves forward. And it needs the World Philosophical Forum because the international community is more than ever seen by more and more people of conducting activities lacking in substance, far removed from any of humanity's major problems and of putting into place special arrangements favoring the interests of the more powerful states, organizations, and individuals. And this is not the way to go. And it is within a system where the rule of law is based more on self-interest than benefit for the world's populations. Its leadership and protective filters are seen as having their own personal agenda, which impede legitimate outsiders. So this is why I am so thrilled here to see the response here in KL to the World Philosophy Day. This we have to augment, this we have to boost, this we have to turn up the volume, and I think the only way we can do it is by building those bridges, those bridges between Asia and Europe, between Europe and Asia, and between all of the continents. So I think that we have to be able to, we, we, we cannot do away with the United Nations. The United Nations is important. It's, it's one of the few things we have. So we have to be very careful when we talk about its failures. We have to do, talk about its failures constructively. Constructively in the sense that we can help. We can help. Think of ourselves in this room as a think tank. A think tank of ideas that could be useful to the international community. So we have to deal with the rapidly growing mindset of concern telling us that little time is left to look back and that much more effort is needed to shape the future. The go global governance system is in trouble and we wish to help the international community to get on a better route, to find a better train 
to the future. You know, there is the destination that we're heading for and there is the route that we will take. And we have to be very careful with both. We have to be careful not to destroy. We have to be careful what we're building. It's a complex situation, not easy. Friends of philosophy, today philosophy is celebrating. Together we celebrate philosophy. Philosophy is an agent of encouragement and a cure for anxiety. Philosophy is closely connected with the development of humanity, its better side, human thought and culture, cultural development, cultural phenomenon. Philosophy studies fundamental problems such as our concept of reality, our existence and what it means and we have to make it mean more within the sense of a fulfilling life in terms of Socratic thinking. It means knowledge, speech, mind-brain dichotomies and language, our principles and our values. And the quote from Mother Teresa says, go back, go back home and and, and be with your families, love your families. And that's where the values start from. That's where we either become collective or individual. That's where our values come. Someone who has a value, who believes in capital punishment at eight, nine, 10 years of age that has come from his background will believe in it when he's 80. So we have to start very, very young indeed. So it's wonderful to celebrate World Philosophy Day here, but I would like to move towards completion by just making a few comments about Greece, which has given much to humanity, health, education, philosophy, and to the evolution of Europe. And yet there, for example, in Europe, there is Brexit pulling out of Europe, and there is Greece that has tried desperately to stay in Europe, and it's my opinion, has been ill-treated by Europe and the international community. Small country, yes, and big countries can often get away with that. Prometheus gave fire to man to warm him. This was the beginning of public health and social services. Demeter, bread to feed him, and hygiene, public health to protect him. But climate change today is mishandling our planet and politics is mishandling climate change. And what we are moving towards is a new, almost I could say devastating equilibrium that can remove us from the planet. And the news in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists that places the symbolic timepiece at two minutes to midnight tells us that the threat is imminent. The recent studies are telling us that climate change, and we have to deal with them, this is parallel uh, dealing with problems, uh, which means a concerted policy which is very complex and very, very difficult, and it means cooperation. It means internationalism, it means supranationalism. And uh, it's a difficult road to take. So we have to overcome our ignorance, we have to overcome our arrogance, and we have to overcome the inequality that these have made. And I leave you with a few thoughts that shows 
how culture can develop. Asclepius and his children, his daughter, the goddess of health, I mentioned her hygiene. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, and the teacher, and Asclepius, his teacher, they taught amazingly, and they taught amazing things, all useful for today and for our future. Asclepius said to his student, we have an opinion. Let's consider it. If it is not confirmed, we can change it. We are talking about concepts that characterize a cultured mind. And this is where we should be heading for. Minds that have the capacity to examine a proposal without necessarily accepting it. We are talking about philosophy. A bastion against the narrowing of opinions as one of the director generals of UNESCO has recently said, and the narrowing of minds. So for many reasons we are celebrating here in Malaysia and we are having a good time in that celebration. Let's not forget humor and let's not forget about having a good time with our colleagues, with our families, with our friends, etc. And I think that finally a quote from English poetry that I would like to suggest that kind of tells us that we should trust. It's sometimes when we look at these things it's very difficult to say I trust. But it says I have seen flowers come in stony places and kind things done by men with ugly faces and the gold cup, the horse race, the gold cup won by the worst horse in the races. So I trust too. In the youth forum that I just completed in Belgrade with about 120 young people from all over the world, at the end I used the following event to send them on their way, as it were. I was saying that in our teaching, we need much more inspiration. We need more teachers who inspire, inspire our young people, because we've lost touch with our young people. Unemployment, they're leaving, they're joining the migration trails in a different sense to the migration trails were explained by the previous teacher. Uh, and I want to go to another philosopher in ancient Greece for a moment. Think of Alexander the Great, who is referenced, I am told, in many times in the Quran. In Egypt, he promoted religious tolerance and cultural fusion. He was inspired by Aristotle, his philosopher, teacher, and by Heracles, his hero, who when he killed the Lernian Hydra, he rid the marshes of malaria. It is symbolic for malaria, the mosquito. But I ended by telling them that when Alexander the Great, as a boy, in front of his father, Philippos, saw Bucephalus, that fantastic horse, with that gigantic head and the brain, uh, he said, Dad, if it was today, I want to ride. And Philippos said, go ahead, expecting him to be thrown from the horse. And Alexander the Great had realized that the horse was afraid of the light, the sun. Sometimes we sit in windows and the sun affects us. And he put his hands over the eyes of the horse and he led him 
out towards the pasture and quickly mounted him and broke the horse. His father was amazed and told Alexander, who became Alexander the Great, my son, find other kingdoms to conquer. Macedonia will not hold you. Thank you. A very, back, a very big thank you to Professor Louvet. You may take a seat now. Okay, very poetic indeed. We have listened so far. We have um, heard a lot of words of wisdom from him, talking about marriages, from, and then talking about lifelong learning in education and relationships of the Asia as well as Europe, um, rather than talking about separation as well. So it is really interesting, and we can find out that the world right now is really facing a lot of problems and issues. Namely, and uh, I could tell you the list is endless, starting from a war, Hostility, hostility, climate change, corruptions, inequality, and etc. Cetera, and etc. Cetera. But mind you, there's no flower without the rain, right? So out of this, all this catastrophe, whatever problem that we have, it all comes from the grace of God. Quote from you, <laughs> and then. Um, from here, ladies and gentlemen, it comes Homer, it comes Socrates, and not to mention today, it comes Dr. Halloween, or oh, it's not Halloween. <laughs> it comes um, the man of the day today, Pak Habib, uh, Professor Hussein Al Atas, and also Professor Jeffrey Lewis. Okay, with that, I think. Uh, we are so fortunate to have him to talk about a lot of word of wisdom today. So without further ado, I would like to summarize whatever that you have today. It's just like whatever that your, your talk today, Professor, you are just like um, the, talking about the common denominator of trading of the talk. It is about engineering and physics. It's about bioengineering and physiology. It's about public health and health diplomacy, as well as health and biophilosophy. So it is a system of theory, actually. System of theory of communication and control in man, machine, as well as society. So I conclude it is a holistic theory in life. You have covered it all, all right? And it is actually uh, the essence of today's well, Philosophical Forum Day. So by that, I would like to open the floor for any questions or any, any statement that you would like to share with us regarding uh, doctors, uh, professors, Louis' talk for today. All right, thank you. We take from the gentleman in the middle. Would you like to introduce yourself first? Uh, very good morning. My name is uh, Muhammad Shafiq. I'm a PhD student of philosophy here in Kuala Lumpur. I'm also uh, serving in a think tank in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, first of all, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying that how much I really appreciate your vision, Professor, with regards to uh, the role of philosophy in addressing our contemporary problems, or shall we say, uh, due to the, the lack of substance or, uh, in a, in a predominantly in the global discourse. But I think you may have observed by now, Professor, that in many places, including ours, we have somehow been disconnected with our own philosophical tradition. There is a very rich tradition here for centuries, and they are still living inheritors of these people, but yet we are disconnected from them. So I would perhaps to augment your 
tremendous efforts here. We need to build bridges with the best representatives of the respective traditions in the world, including this place, which I think will definitely augment your, augment your efforts tremendously. Um, just to share, like for instance, um, I recently I just organized a Young Muslims Forum intended to bring to the public domains some co philosophical conversations. And, and we bring, try to bring youth from the corporate sector and so on. But again, we see a dearth of philosophical knowledge, uh, Professor. So I think it's key that we augment your efforts by building with the right representatives who are inheritors of this great tradition so that, sh so that our conversations will be truly uh, enriching and you know, uh, more purposeful. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your comment. I think it's a very important comment because we have many disconnects. There is a disconnect, for example, in Greece uh, between the academic community of uh, philosophy and also the practical sense of philosophy that may be used, may be promoted, may be developed in such a way that we can solve many problems. So I think that is one thing. But there is also a disconnect from democracy. We may live in democracies, but what we see around us are elements that are taking us away from democracy. Uh, we, in the United States, for example, there is a disconnect, uh, uh, and therefore they have brought the STEM program of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to strengthen it. So I, I think you've hit a big word which brings many, many problems, a disconnect. And I don't think there is an easy answer. My answer is, my own personal answer, is that we have to go move from problem solving in the sense of the chessboard you know, which has many, many moves on it, it's very complicated, and it's very intellectual game, to a network, because we're in networks today, and this is why my emphasis is on the bridge. The bridge is just one link, but there are many links that we have to develop. So I thank you for your comment, and if I'm correct, I don't know, uh, philosophy seem to drop out of your curricula a few years ago. And I think that this is to be reintroduced at many levels, including the school level, so that young people at their earliest possible chance can listen to the world of philosophy besides all of the other things they need to live and to work and to develop and to prosper in our very complicated world. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, can we have another <clears throat> questions? Yeah. Uh, I am Hashim. I represent Ulama, U-L-A-M-A, -A, Umo Lanjud Makin Active. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I would like to express my, my association on this particular World Philosophy Day, and the uh, the topic of discussion revolves around peace. Yeah, but peace in this world appears to be evasive. Evasive because most nations appear to have as their national objective GNP, Gross National Product. When we talk about gross national product. It means money. It has got to start with greed. Yeah? So once we have that greed, and uh, you find that the country is in, in facing lots of problems. Eh? In fact, Bhutan has shown a way. We should be going for gross national happiness. Mm. A more balanced sort of approach as far as uh, development is concerned um, having economic development, 
But at the same time, looking after your environment, and then at the same time, taking care of the social well-being of the population. So, uh, on many fora, I've been also supporting this, uh, advocating gross national happiness as the way to go in our economic development. That's my, my comment, uh, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. So, gross national happiness instead of gross national GNP. All right, thank you. It's, it's a wonderful point. How are we going to convince the economists? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, in the health sector, there is quite a lot of data that shows that the therapeutic work of the doctor is more efficient when dealing with patients who have a spiritual outlook or an outlook of happiness or an outlook of uh, uh, the lust for life. So I think that there is something in it and I believe that this is what we really need and we get much of this from our families, from our colleagues, but we don't go far enough. But I, I, I like your comment and I think it's very important in the health sector. All right, do we have one more, one last question? Yes, Professor Roy. All right, I'd like to challenge my friend's associates, so Professor Jeffrey, uh, ability to associate philosophy with the public health in which he's an expert. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to commend him and thank him for making what is really a very good and wise roundup of uh, ways of bridging over the difficulties and uh, differences between Asian and, and European cultures. Well done for that. Now, to bring uh, things a little bit down to earth, could you please, dear Jeffrey, tell us how would philosophy, particularly practical philosophy, contribute to a more um, uh, wise uh, health and well-being funding uh, scheme so that uh, most societies uh, on earth would profit at large? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a, a, a difficult question, but I would say that if our education can move us away from consumerism, that would be one step forward. If our systems, for example, in Belgrade, one of the, the projects, which is fascinating, hasn't got anywhere because you remember not too long ago there was a war in the Balkans and therefore there was a need for, uh, uh, for, for military equipment. And a Serbian general came with the project of conversion of the military industry or the military complex in Serbia for peaceful means. There was lots of discussion about it, interesting discussion, but it didn't get anywhere. So I will stay with starting with children. I think this is where we can have the most impact in education. Education for everyone, lifelong learning. Socrates who said, tell me what that song is. And the soldier said, you're going to die tomorrow. Why worry? He said, I want to learn something else. But that learning something else at that age had to be there at a much earlier time. So what I would love to do is use philosophy, make it more part of education in schools from kindergarten all the way through to university and beyond and to use it also as a means of offsetting what we see as consumerism that is wanting more and more and more and more than our neighbor for example which takes us away from collaboration, from conviviality, and many, many other things. 
education first, education for children maybe before the first. Thank you. I think um, we should end by now. And one more question. Uh, would you be able to take one more? Okay, one last one, one final one. Okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, again, thank you for your uh, informative and very important uh, and presentation. So my question is related to, again, you know, peace and stability at global level, because, you know, I'm from uh, Somalia, where conflict is usually very high. That's why I'm interested in, you know, peace and stability. So my question is this. UN represents the will of nations, and it stands for to promote and ensure peace and stability at a global level. So when we see within the UL, UN itself, there is high polarization in terms of discrimination, injustice, and inequality in the UN itself. Because some countries, they have veto powers. Some countries, their voices are not heard. Some countries and their rights are not granted. So can't we say that? Since UN has all these, you know, factories that and threaten to peace, it should be, and uh, it should be revised in its role. And can't we say that UN, at this present time, it is not in the position to ensure peace and stability because there is polarization in, in itself, discrimination, injustice, and equality. These three factories are in the, uh, within the UN itself. So then how can we say US, uh, UN is promoting peace and ensuring instability? Because there are these factories within, within itself. So that's my question. Thank you. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I believe you said you come from Somalia, which is, uh, has been... Uh, conflict-ridden the Horn of Africa uh, for many years, and it seems that things may be moving in the right direction, but there are still major problems. And of course, what I recall was uh, something that I have used in, 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 in some scientific works of the creeping disasters of, of a famine, because famine is a creeping disaster that depended upon the absence of rain, for example, or then the other way around, flooding. So I think that what you are saying is very, very important for your region. I believe that the United Nations is a very positive force. And I think we should be able to, we, we should find ways to develop an interlink between our forum and the United Nations, which it is related to, and the organization in Belgrade that is part of the United Nations, and this is what we are trying to do, that is to be constructively critical, to try to find ways how the United Nations and the international community as a whole can overcome, let me call them internal problems, we could talk about this later as to what I mean by that, but I think that you're in an area that requires philosophy, but you require a lot, lot more than that in the Horn of Africa. And uh, it's uh, a large set of problems. But I think that two years ago uh, in Ethiopia, there was the World uh, Congress of Public Health. It was the World uh, Association of Public Health the World Federation of Public Health Associations. And some of these problems were debated, but just to debate a problem is insufficient. We need to go to a policy formulation. It's not sufficient. We need to have funding to be able to move that policy forward. And we need, as we were told yesterday at Perdana University, the problem is implementation. We have difficulties in implementation. This is why we have to bring into the equation more and more young people who have the
the minds, the hearts, and the intelligence to put forward solutions that maybe we, the older people, can look at and give some advice, but there is where the strength is. There is where the strength of our society lies, in our youth. They are the future. Very well said, uh, Professor. All right. With that, since time is very limited, I think I would also like to be a little bit philosophical today. So I would read out uh, a, a poetry. All right. Um, there comes a time when we should be together, united and not fight to make things better. Our world is here, but not but will not be forever, depending on our will to change the matter. This is the song of hope. This is also the song of hope. This is the song of hope. If one could be for all, and all could be for one, together we are better under the sun. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the second paper presentation. We would like to thank Honorable Professor Dr. Jeffrey Levitt from United Nations Mandated University for Peace, European Center for Peace and Development for being the second presenter. We would also like to thank Associate, Pro Associate Professor Dr. Noor Azila Hussein from University Slango for taking the role as moderator for the second session. As a token of appreciation, we would like to invite Honorable Dr. Hasbullah Zakaria, Deputy Secretary General, World Philosophical Forum, to present souvenirs as token of appreciation to both of them. Please welcome. <laughs> Firstly, please welcome Professor Dr. Jeffrey Levitt. UN mandated University for Peace European Center for Peace and Development to receive the souvenirs. Next, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Nur Azila Hussein, University of Slango, to receive the souvenirs. We would like to thank Dr. Hasbullah Zakaria for presenting the souvenirs.